I'm Margaret Pierce with the Garden Club of Houston and um, I'm here in the Memorial Park Conservancy Greenhouse working on the Garden Club's project called Natives in the City. And this is our project which we started about five years ago uh, growing from seed native plants and our objective is to teach people who live in an urban environment with limited garden space that they can participate in the native plant movement and um, as we all know uh, it's super important to have native plants in our yard because they support our native critters our birds our bees our butterflies etc and if you only have non-native plants you'll probably notice that you don't see much activity. We also want to impart the message to our, uh, our uh, audience that one native is great, but a collection of diverse natives far better supports all the critters in your yard. And so our project, Natives in the City, is offering collections of native plants at our annual plant sale. Um, we sell everything from bulbs to trees to vines to roses but we also sell our native plants and all of our profits go back to the city to support native gardens, um, school gardens, teaching gardens, um, educational uh, lectures and so forth that uh, inform people about environmental issues that are important. Um, so this project is something that we do every year where we start in uh, the middle of winter, we start planting seeds and nurture them throughout the spring, summer, bump them up. That's a term that means taking a seedling that's in a little container and putting it in a bigger container. And anyway, we bump up plants so that by the time of our sale in October, we've got one gallon sized plants. And you can see here that we have a variety of plants, Gulf Coast Muley, Landscape Coreopsis, Inland Sea Oats, um, Seaside Goldenrod, Spiderwort, Cardinal Flower. We've got all sorts of plants. And um, whatever we don't sell at our plant sale, we donate back to Memorial Park Conservancy and they plant all of our natives in the park. Last year, we donated over 900 plants to the park. We have a very synergistic, collaborative uh, relationship with Memorial Park Conservancy. They allow us to use their greenhouse, their uh, planting supplies, their irrigation systems, and in return, we donate plants to the park. So it's a win-win. My name is Sally Hilliard, and this is our backyard garden uh, that we started um, probably three or four years ago. Really, this uh, journey to have a, a native garden began um, when we decided to do a butterfly garden along the side of our house. And we took a course from Glenn Olson at Rice University, and he taught a course in um, gardening for birds and butterflies. And at the time, he said, everyone should join the Native Plant Society. So uh, we sort of embarked on a journey of learning about the Native Plant Society and the Audubon Society and all these various um, native groups here in Houston that promote uh, planting native plants because um, it brings in the native insects and amphibians, and which supports the the um, fauna, the birds and the butterflies and all the things you really want to come to your garden. So <clears throat> in 2020 we bought the lot behind us and all of a sudden had all this sunlight. We hadn't had much sun before and started planting native plants and I think the native plants have taken over the garden. <laughs> it's, uh, it's gotten so big and colorful and ungainly <laughs> in many ways too. Uh, behind me are some Turk's cap and a salvia that the uh, pollinators just love and some native gara that when the sun's out the bees are just bouncing in, uh, inside the little flowers. So we had a mixture of natives and native varietals and then some really non-natives like roses. But uh, we have loved it and um, everything has added something to the garden, even the roses when all of the natives have faded for the winter, those roses keep blooming away so we've appreciated 
them too. We had a Nelson water garden put in the pond, and at the time they put in some water lilies that were not natives, the purples, the, the big purples, and the bluish looking ones, or the non-native ones, and, um, but then we went down to Green Star Nursery in Alvin, that owned by Mary Carol Edwards, who's, they just have a fabulous water uh, garden facility down there where they grow all kinds of water-loving plants, and um, I bought the native uh, water lilies there, and they bloom yellow and white. And so I don't think there's any blooming right this second. They're more of maybe summertime, and it's getting into the fall now. Um, let's see that I had some empty beds when we first started out, and I bought a packet of wildflower seeds from the from Ladybird Johnson's uh, facility, and that may have been a, a mistake because the 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 wildflowers that were nicely growing right here in this bed have, have spread all over the whole garden and they just come up everywhere. But they're beautiful, but it's hard to manage and keep a manicured look uh, with wildflowers. They just kind of come up everywhere. The, the flowers growing over the pond there are Maximilian sunflower that we planted in one place and now there, there are many places in the garden. And we have um, goldenrod that you can see in the background that I think we planted right there. And I thought it was seaside goldenrod, which isn't supposed to spread, but it, it turned out it wasn't, and it just spread all over the back of the garden. And I know that um, if you want a real manicured-looking garden, that's not a plant for you because it's very difficult to control, but it's just absolutely stunning in the fall. And it's just so fun to watch the monarchs and the swallowtails and the gulf fertility butterflies just flitting all around back there. It's just, it's just beautiful. Um, my husband is in the oil and gas tank cleaning business, so having tanks was a fun project for him around the house. But this, of course, is a water tank, and we put in this 2,500 gallon, I think, um, uh, water tank and it collects the water off of the roof of the this little cottage and then the garage back here they both feed and really a good rain completely fills the tank so I, I use it just for my own wa watering pot plants and when I'm growing things that, from seed and things where I'd want to rain water instead of the our tap water that's got so much chlorine in it. I think it's a little healthier for the plants. But it's just kind of a fun feature in the garden too. We've got it covered with this maypop vine, the, um, which is a host, uh, it's a passiflora. We sell it at the Bulb Mart. And it's, um, it tracks the uh, Gulf fritillary butterfly that lays its eggs on it, that makes a caterpillar, that eats up the leaves of the uh, maypop and then grows into the butterfly. But uh, you can see it makes tons of leaves, so it's never in danger of uh, running out of space for the butterflies. My husband has a uh, beehive as well, just one. Back here we took a uh, leisure learning class some years ago from a man who taught about keeping bees, and um, he's been doing it ever since. Makes it, uh, just one hive makes more honey than you can give away, really. Uh, it's just an incredible amount of honey. This tree that's weeping over the pond is actually a bald cypress. It's a weeping bald cypress. I think the, the, the name you'll see in the nursery sport is called Falling River Cypress. But um, I heard that it was a mutant form of the native uh, bald cypress. So it's not been engineered by any nursery to, to actually weep, but it's found that way in the wild. So it's really a native. This is an oak leaf hydrangea. It is a, a native our area and it blooms just a beautiful white in the spring and then it uh, goes the whites turn pink and then they fade to this brown uh, that, that they hold throughout the summer and fall which I, I just think are beautiful but um, after after they start to fall off I'll come back and, and prune them down but these plants are from the boat market and uh, they've grown and, and gotten much bigger. So, it's, and, and they bloom in the, or it's under two big oak trees, so they bloom well in the, in the um, shade. Uh, this is a real fun little plant that we call a strawberry bush because the, the berry looks so much like a little strawberry. It actually looks maybe a little bit like, like a, a raspberry, 
too. I don't know. But then it makes these fun little orange seeds that uh, show up right now, and so you've got a, a fun combination of red and orange, or deep, deep uh, pink and orange on the, on the plant at one time. Okay, I have a couple of these around my yard, sort of, and in, in not the most, uh, well, this is right by my front door, but it's the Aristolochia tomentosa, which is the woolly pipe vine, uh, and we sell it at the Walmart usually, and it's a host plant for the swallowtail butterfly, and uh, really, it's been most successful in my yard. I just have so many swallowtails in the summertime. It's fun, and, it, and often it's just covered with caterpillars. One of our favorite little trees in the garden is this button bush that uh, gets covered with these white flowers that are just so beautiful. Right now it's covered with the seed, seed pods and uh, it's just a magnet for butterflies and bees and bumblebees and um, my, I sit here in my front window just watching the butterflies and bees here during the summertime. It, uh, I whack it back because it just gets too big for the space that it's in, but every year it comes back out and it's just covered with flowers and, and um, then these cool seeds. This is, uh, I took cuttings from an old mulberry tree that I hope is a red mulberry in Rockport and brought them back and after several tries finally got it to root and uh, we planted two of them here in the front of our house and they've gotten pretty big. And um, every year they make these great berries that really attract the birds. Uh, we've seen whole flocks of those, what are those bandit birds that, uh, that come in and eat the berries. So it's fun, it's a fun tree to have in your yard. This is uh, another native vine, it's a, a cross vine. We sell one at the Walmart called, it's a varietal called a tangerine something cross vine. But I love it because it, it grows, uh, it, it's here under the shade of the oak tree in the spring. It's just a blanket of uh, orangey uh, trumpet shaped flowers, small ones, not like the, not like the one, the, the trumpet vine. And then it grows up into the tree and you can, walking down the sidewalk, you can, it looks like the oak tree is just filled with orange blossoms. It's really fun. Uh, one of the things that Glenn Olson said uh, to attract birds to your garden is to have a water uh, feature. And this is a, a bird bath kind of design the way he said to design it, which is a rough hewn cement, not too deep, and uh, just with running water that gets circulated back to the, the basin underneath. And so I have to clean it out about once a week to keep it free of leaves and, and the water clean. But um, that we get birds here all the time taking baths. I sit in my window and watch that too. The, um, blue jays and uh, uh, titmice and uh, all kind of fun birds come in here to take baths from time to time. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Howley and I'd like to show some of my um, my native plants that I'm working on. Um, we're gradually working on changing the gardens that we have at our house um, from very traditional gardens into more native plants. Um, to promote biodiversity and to encourage the uh, native insects and um, pollinators to really be uh, using our yard as, uh, as a place for their habitat um, and to find a bite to eat and uh, for refuge. Let me show you some things about our pocket prairie. So this was a very traditional rose garden when we first bought um, the property um, and it's been over 10 years but um, decided to take that rose garden and um, turn it into the pocket prairie so we added things like Turk's cap and then we have flame acanthus and over here are this, this this is strawberry bush and we have the original like the climbing roses um, and the Texas lantana and the purple cone flower and what else do we have in here? Um, oh, the bone set, um, which is going to seed right now, but it's really a great pollinator. So this part of the house, uh, the garden, um, used to be very traditional with boxwoods and azaleas, more boxwoods, and then a space out in front for seasonal um, annuals. And what we did is we changed the boxwoods into, um, we changed them over to yopon, and we found that they are much hardier 
they grow great and they are native plants. Um, most recently what we've done is we've changed this area from being the seasonal annuals to now having some native plants. So things like the white mist flower and some of the asters. And then this area over here, we took out some of the azaleas that were um, significantly damaged during the last winter storm. And we've put in um, a lot of different native plants um, that are just taking hold and uh, will start growing. And hopefully by this spring will be um, in full bloom and, um, and looking really good. One thing that we've planted is the inland sea oats and um, they are shade loving and they will multiply rapidly. Uh, one thing that I've just learned is that inland sea oats, when you tie them together and um, when they are seeding and they've got the little, you know, looks like an oat hanging off of the top and you tie them together, you can put them in a floral arrangement and it looks so good. So here we have Eastern Red Buds, and it's on the side of our driveway be between our neighbor's house, and um, sometimes it gets shaded by the house um, during the middle of the day. Uh, does not really receive the western sun. Up underneath we have um, the Gulf Muley, and so if you're planning this, um, I'd probably put it in a more in a sunnier area instead of um, quite such a shady spot. It has taken a few years. It looks good now, but it's taken a few years to establish. Okay, so here we are in the backyard, and I have to say I'm kind of a little bit of an experimental gardener, and um, so I like to put different things, you know, in different spots and see what works and what doesn't. Um, and I will say, my approach is that you don't have to be a purist. Um, here we have a Copper Canyon Daisy, and if you like something that's really fragrant, this has such a strong and good fragrance um, to it. It's it's really nice, and in the later on, it um, will have lots of yellow flowers all over it. So I'm standing under a wax myrtle, and in the fall, the wax myrtle has little blue berries and it attracts the yellow rumped warbler. That's one thing that I really like to try to garden for are the, the birds. Um, I love seeing the birds in, in my yard. Um, things that they like are like the coral berry or the, the pigeon berry, um, those types of plants. Um, I've also got the fire spike. It's non-native, but um, I like having it in my yard because it attracts the hummingbirds. When we were landscaping and putting in a vine that was going to go along this fence line, we wanted to have a host plant, and I wanted to use the passion vine for the Gulf Fritillary butterfly as a host plant. Um, I neglected to ask for the purple one and instead got the red one, which unfortunately is not a host plant. So just a word to the wise, make sure you ask before putting it in and having it establish itself all across your fence line, um, that it will be a host plant for the butterflies. When we bought our house, one of the things in the backyard that framed the sides that were along the fence, fence line were these tall ligustrums. And um, in trying to create uh, more of a habitat and a, and a bird-friendly environment in our backyard, um, I didn't want to take out the ligustrums because that would cause a lot of disruption. And so what we've been trying to do over time is, is lift up the canopy um, of the ligustrums and to um, trim the suckers along the, the base and to trim some of the, the branches that are underneath. And the idea is to create layers so that there's more of um, kind of a, a wooded type of feel and um, there's like a mid layer and the higher layer where the birds can be up in the the branches of the ligustrum but then it can also be in the mid level and then have plenty of room on the bottom um, where there's there's brush there's leaves there's all kinds of things that they can find in uh, underneath the leaves and uh, all kinds of food little uh, um, and definitely lots of worms and caterpillars and um, all kinds of insects for them to eat. So 
one of the things that I wanted to point out is that the leaf cutter bee has eaten away the edges of the leaves of this eastern redbud and just want to reinforce that you don't we're not looking for perfection this is what we want we want to be feeding you know the the native bees the native insects the birds the caterpillars everything that we can encouraging the wildlife and promoting the biodiversity in our region